everybody to come in. So waiting means you have nothing to do, you can just relax. It's funny how we all have this wish for a free time, right? Then when the free time comes and there's nothing to do, what happens? We get bored. So we so full of contradictions. We fill the time that we would have in that world, especially telephone. question which is I'm sorry I hope to address it so what is the soul so very simple and very easy in Buddhism they don't posit the soul so we don't need to go into big discussions what is the soul we don't know what the soul is and there's very different views on what the soul is okay so in Buddhism there is mind at different levels so there's a mind that can be very deluded with like very strong counterproductive mental factors. And, uh, but the basis of the mind, it's like watering, the basis of the mind is always clean and it's always clear. Would see things as they are, but because of our misconceptions and grasping of things that are being really true, then we don't see the things the way they are. So that's, that's how they would say. But in that mind, there is natural goodness, there is natural intelligence, and there's natural space. But that can be very, very covered with misconceptions, wrong views, anger, attachment, jealousy, arrogance, and all this. What one, what one calls that counterproductive. Counterproductive for what? Counterproductive for that you can live the nature of your mind as being compassionate, loving, spacious, intelligent. Okay? Because it covers it. Um, so every time you go to sleep, if you go into deep sleep, all these other stuff is kind of absorbing and doesn't function. And this is why we like sleep so much. But then there's a more subtle mind and waking mind who comes up and it produces dreams. And dreams can be used in a very good way. Dreams can be used by us seeing the strength of the mind to create a story when nothing is there. And to totally go along with it. And this is why the name Buddha means awake. Okay? So, a Buddha sees the dream as dream. For a Buddha, there is also conventional reality. But he sees it as a dream, something created by the mind. And what the Buddha creates through his mind, I don't have no clue. But, um, yeah, because everybody has a different reality. So this is why there is not one true reality, because they're all different. But for each one, for me, that reality, I see that becomes true. Relatively true, eventually true. Yeah, this is what we're trying to observe. And what we're trying to see that it is lack or this need of a separate, separate meaning something more than the body and the mind. Permanent, permanent meaning always feeling the same. Yeah? Autonomous, autonomous meaning not needing the body and the mind to exist. What else is there? And singular, only one. This is what's, what is being negated, that there's like a third entity, body, mind, plus I, and we talk like this. We say, my body, my mind. That implies there's something there that possesses it. So if I am the possessor of my body, you know, I should be able to live without the body, because I, if I'm the possessor of these handkerchiefs, I can throw them away. They still exist, I still exist. If I take away body and mind, what can you still have? And then many people say the soul. So I can't go into that discussion as a discussion because I don't know what the soul is. And very, I, I haven't met anybody yet who can really explain to me what the soul is. Yes? In this way, in Buddhist uh, eye, what's uh, what go through on, uh, on the rebirth? Yeah, the mere eye, the merely labeled eye. Labeled on the con continuity of the consciousness that goes into a very subtle state. That goes on. Can I get it? Yeah, I don't know. 
the merely labeled I. You know, the I that needs this consciousness to continue. If you need, in order to say... When the consciousness you, disappears. Huh? Okay? The consciousness no. disappears. No, 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 no. When you die... No, it goes into a subtle state. It doesn't disappear. The gross consciousness disappears, but not the subtle one. And the gross and the subtle consciousness, they're not separate. Yeah, they are like steam, water, and ice. Ice, very solid, our gross consciousness. Water, more flexible, doesn't need objects in order to create a story, is our dreaming consciousness. The steam, all these examples fall short, but anyway, you know, very subtle. But all of it is water. All of it is of the same kind. And the, the definition of mind is clear and knowing, but it's not material. Okay, we do the reflection because otherwise you're not getting there. <laughs> because I need to finish in a very short time. Okay, just sitting, you're already sitting, try to sit with a straight back if you can. It helps the, the meridians to clear. It helps the energy channels, they call them energy channels. And in Tibetan tradition, one has 72,000 of them, and three main ones, which are in the back of your body. So this is why it's important to have a straight back, because then the energy that is in these channels can flow freely, and it helps the mind to become stable and calm. It also calms the nervous system when you are sitting freely with a straight back. Yeah? So you can train that also. Has a lot of advantages to be able to sit with the straight back. Makes the mind much clearer and freer. And since we want to be free, so that's quite good. So connect with the body. Um, again, if you're used to open with, if you're used to meditate with your eyes open, you keep them open. If you if you're used to close them, you close them. It's fine. Yeah, it's good to try out different things and then see what works best for you. But don't look at me. Really connect with your body. See how the mind can know what the body is doing without needing the eyes. We have a thing which is called awareness. It's a mental factor. You will feel your body where it makes contact with something. Your nose you will not feel. Your ears you will not feel unless there's tension there. So in order to relax, very short thing, very simple thing, imagine that you're breathing with your whole body. I know it's not possible, you breathe with your lungs. But just imagine that your whole body is breathing. That means you expand as you breathe in. And as you breathe out, you try to become very open and open up. As if the body doesn't have any balance. That relaxes the body very quickly. And then the mind, usually in order to be calm, stable, focused, it needs an object. So again, if you have a usual object you use when you do shamatha meditation, you use that one. Otherwise, I would say use your breath by being aware or knowing that when you're breathing in, you're breathing in, and when you're breathing out, that you are breathing out. And you can then take focal points. If you are very tired and sluggish, you would take the nose. Wakes you up a little bit because the point is quite small. You feel the pressure when you breathe in. If um, you have a lot of thoughts, then you go to your belly and you feel the rising and falling of your abdomen. So you choose where you want to stay. First, you observe what kind of state am I in? Am I kind of nodding off, mind very heavy? Focal point for your breath, you take your nostrils. If you are very agitated, have a lot of thoughts, then you go to your belly and try to not 
not to suppress the thoughts, but just not to make a story out of it, or not to follow them. It's very difficult because it's the function of the mind to think, also one of the functions of the mind. So that's what it will do by habit. When you become aware of the thoughts, you will see the story ends and then another story develops. But the moment you are aware that you're thinking, really knowing that you're thinking, then the story will end. So just try, you know, don't close up, don't tense up, thinking, oh, I need to do that properly. It's okay, relax. It's not a matter of life and death. Try to look at your instincts. How do you see yourself instinctively as being a part of a whole that we call the universe or as being an individual sitting here? example that the tea, water, coffee or whatever you drank this morning came from the universe now is part of you. When does it become part of you? The food we're eating is nourishing our body it also comes from Mother Earth. So try to think now, universe, that means you need, you need to make your mind very big. Try to see if there is a limit to the mind. When you go from this room, to the moshav, to the country, to the continent, to the earth, out into the galaxies, expand with your mind. Bigger, 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 bigger. Is there a point where the where you have to say no? I can't go any further. It's a big question. What is bigger? The universe? or my mind. And then we see ourselves as a tiny, 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 <coughs> tiny, tiny, tiny particle in relation to this universe. How does that make you feel? 
conventional eye thinking. I am just a tiny, tiny, tiny particle. Just, just thinking <coughs> of only human beings. I'm part of it, yes. But I make such a big fuss about myself. In relation to all these others, am I really that big? see what it does to let go of that self-importance that we have to know everything we have to do everything right we can't make any mistakes everybody has to like and love us and see us and pay attention to us all the neediness when we become aware of that goes out of the window but it can give you a lot of space a lot of freedom and just a tiny 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 part of of this universe. A part of it, not separate. And then we draw the mind and come back. earth, to the continent, to this country, to this shop, to this hole, to your body, and then try to feel that we have this feeling of I am special, the instinctive feeling I am special, I am separate, and then just observe it and experience it. How does it feel? How is the sensation of, I'm just a tiny particle of this universe, and the sensation of, I am special, that we all have, we all have this feeling, it's this independent I who thinks I am special. this I appear, does it appear as being part of the body? Just look, yeah? don't, don't go too much analysis, we're looking at instincts here. Does it instinctively feel as part of the mind? does it instinctively feel as separate from the body and the mind, as a third entity, something more? This instinctive feeling of me, I, who has more needs, your I or your body? Your I or your mind? It's okay if you get totally confused, that's the purpose here. Because we're so convinced that there is an I. But when we start to look for it, when we try to pinpoint it, it becomes more and more confusing. When you feel that you need something, who needs something? Your body or your mind or your eye? Who is the nutmeg? Is it your body or your mind or is it the eye? makes you feel unwanted, unloved, afraid, not getting what you want, unhappy, poor, victim. It's mental factors. 
But does it feel as if it's mental factors or does it feel as if it is the I? So even for the people who have been here yesterday, um, don't think you can understand in two days, okay? As I'm saying, if, we would, if it would be easy to understand, you wouldn't be able to pay this course. So, because, you know, it would be quick to understand. I have a thing here which I quickly want to mention because then you can have a look at it in the break. We talk about the mind, and we talk about objects, objects. The mind apprehending objects. So the object does exist, but it doesn't exist the way that it appears to us. So basically what is, is there's two different objects to a deluded mind. There is the object that the mind is apprehending, holding, grasping, seeing. But then there's the object that appears to the mind. So you have what is called the object of engagement, the object that exists, and you have the object of appearance, the object that appears to your mind. So if you are in love with somebody, the object of engagement is a human being. The object of appearance is a very attractive human being. If the same person hurts you, the object of engagement is still a human being with all the features of a human being, but the object of appearance becomes a very unattractive human being. Yeah? So, for us, the only thing we know is directly is the object of appearance, and that one is not true. So, we can do that with kind of optical illusion, and there's a, it's a very good device. Please don't put your fingers inside, not because the spider bites, but because it scratches the mirrors, okay? So, there's a, I'll show you, it's a plastic spider, little spider in here. It's plastic, it doesn't jump, it doesn't move, it doesn't do anything. So you can touch it, but not inside, because it scratches the mirror. And if the mirror is scratched, it doesn't work properly anymore. But because, yeah, it's upside down. But because there is also, I, I glued them together so that people don't go, yeah? Um, so don't do duff copies, okay? That's because I say, please don't touch and don't go because of Dovka. Dovka is cool, no? Yes. Why is nobody laughing? Because <laughs> <laughs> If you don't laugh, I think you don't get the... I, saw, I said it different, you know, wrong. No, it's all natural for us. So huh? It's a natural thing. Uh-huh, okay. It's only fun to say people don't do Dovka. Yes. So we don't laugh a bit. It's, ah, it's, it's, a, it's a common thing to say to people. It's don't do Dovka. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was a joke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I won't use it anymore. <laughs> but don't do Dovka, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so so it, it has two mirrors, but the, the mirror here, it's two parts, has a hole. So if you hold this at the right in here, it's not so good. I'll put it outside because of the, because of the lights. If you hold this in the right angle, the, the spider is actually sitting inside, it's being projected up here where there's a hole. Mm. So you can touch the hole, but don't go to the bottom, okay? There's a hole, but it looks absolutely real, as if the spider is sitting on top, if you have it at the right angle. Mm. So the object of engagement is the, is the, uh, is the spider on the bottom. That one exists, okay? The object of appearance, though, is the spider here, and it doesn't exist, but it appears. So knowing this whole thing, even you're afraid of spiders, you might be able to go here with your, with your finger. Sometimes you might even, you, you, you cannot, because there's so much disgust for spiders that you can't go here, yeah? So our mind is constantly preoccupied with objects of appearance, which then adds something or takes something away. 
So this spider exists as an appearance, but it does not exist really, truly, and all this. It comes into existence on top of this because of the conditions. Two mirrors, a hole in the top, and you holding it at the right angle, and your eye consciousness seeing the spider. Now the big question is, you don't need to find the answers, we only need to have the right questions. The big question is, does this spider exist on top here, when nobody looks? Oh. <laughs> okay, so now Leora has a few things to say to you. I put this outside, don't fight for it, you know. In the one hour break, you will have enough, uh, or even more than an hour. Have, we'll have lunch from uh, one to two. So uh, you have time to go and look at it and just wonder. So you don't need to figure it out. Your mind needs to go, wow, without wanting to put concepts and truths and understanding on top of it. Because if you want to understand emptiness, you need to be very open, not wanting to find an answer. Because the people who are experts, like uh, Dharma Kirti, when they go, you know, the key to the middle way, they don't say how things exist. They only say how they don't exist. Because the moment you come up with an opinion, you have somebody that can contradict that opinion, and then again, it's not true. Yeah? So this is why. You don't need to find what exists. You only need to see that the spider up here does not exist, then your fear goes. You don't need to see where the spider is. Do you see what I mean? This is how you approach emptiness. Not, but how do things exist? And this is our mind, our fear, our ego needs reference points, need things to grasp onto, and then we lose our freedom. And then we're not open. Because then it is like this, not like that. This is the prison that our optical delusion, that Einstein says, we are creating ourselves. Okay. Okay. You want the microphone, I guess, yeah.